So do you want me to just first introduce who you are, um, a little bit about yourself? Yes, so uh, my name's Addie. Um, I hmm, introduce a little bit about myself. I do lots of things. I used to be an athlete, mostly, um, but at the moment I am studying my uh, doctorate in clinical psychology. I do a little bit of um, volunteering and work with an organisation called Satellite Foundation. Um, which supports children who have parents with mental illness and we try to connect with their families but primarily our programs are for the children. So yeah, I love doing that. Um, I've got an older brother and a younger sister So, and, and um, my mum's still around. My, uh, my dad had bipolar disorder um, and he, uh, we lost him to suicide about eight years ago now. So mm. Um, I've actually got a photo of him sitting on my desk sort of right in front of me. He's always there with me. But, yeah, so that drives a lot of the work and a lot of the interests that I have in this space and I guess in, in the field of mental health. Um, yeah, I love my family, um, very family-oriented family and, yeah, it's they're pretty important to me. So Thanks for that introduction. So there's a lot to unpack there, so I'll try and do my best. And let's just say you won't just say the old athlete. Yeah, you weren't just any old athlete. You were quite, um, you were quite uh, for Australia. You rode. Do you want to talk, touch a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I was lucky enough in 2017. I moved up to New South Wales to train out of the National Training Centre for yet to be on the Australian rowing team. Um, but prior to that, I'd spent, I don't know, probably about seven years or seven or eight years rowing fairly competitively sort of through school. I learned with a really good friend of mine at school, Jen Cleary, who went to the uh, the Rio Games, um, Rio Olympic Games. Um, I learned with her dad and, yeah, we used to go out on the weekends together, but then also I was lucky to go to a school that had a lot of sport involvement, so I got to row as extracurricular activity while I was at school. Um, yeah, and I loved it. I was kind of all right at it which makes it easier to do um, and I love that it's such a team sport you're around your mates and you have to kind of get on one uh, one track mind with each other and um, it also kind of offers like a mindfulness kind of activity as well because you're so focused on um, it's a really repetitive uh, action kind of like running but a little bit more complicated so it really takes your mind really takes mental power, but a lot of focus. So I love it for that. I've loved it for that reason as well, um, and getting out in nature. So yeah, then I um, after I finished school, moved up to Melbourne and rode at a club level and a state level. Um, made a lot of great friends doing that, and yeah, got into some underage teams, like an under twenty one team. We went and raced in. Uh, New Zealand and then um, an underaged Aussie team we went to the under 23 worlds uh, twice that was pretty it's all pretty cool awesome stuff you get to do fly overseas and sort of do lots of fundraising in the lead up to that um, to sort of pay your way as well um, but yeah since since the end of 20 uh, 2017 I have been focusing more on my studies again. Um, 2017 was a massive year in my life. My auntie got really sick. Um, so that kind of made me reorient my focus for a little bit and wanted to come back home and be near my family. Like I said, they're really important to me. So, yeah, that brought me back from sort of that. That was like seven days a week um, training once on a Sunday, but like three times, six days a week, sort of sun up to sundown, you're thinking about food, recovery and training. It's just like everything you do. Um, so it doesn't leave much space for a lot of other stuff, uh, unfortunately. So, yeah, now I'm doing something different, but it's been a really cool part of my life, definitely. Cool. And you obviously achieved a lot in it. So a lot of that stuff you've learned during that. And the interesting thing you said about it was a meditation almost in a way, and I guess as a younger person, that yeah. would have helped you a lot in the situation. You probably grew up similar to mine. Yeah. Uh, my, mine was more, I've done a lot of sport as well and guitar. So for me, I was always out of the house. Oh, yeah. that, was, that was my that was my 
almost what you would say a stress reliever and you can throw yourself in a lot more um to totally sort of make things easier so that's i tried on to play you... guitar at school um yeah. i i have one in my cupboard but i haven't touched it in so long which is sad but <laughs> i yeah i love my dad was really theatrical loved singing and would kind of embarrass me sometimes doing that in public but um mm. I, you know, I love that about him and yeah, singing actually is another time when I feel great. Not that I do that a lot now, but just, you know, in the shower, in the car. Um, yeah, music is pretty, pretty good for that too. Now let's talk about satellite. So you mentioned, um, that's yeah. the main reason for having you on and, and all that sort of stuff. So I watched, um, your YouTube pitch with Rose who, who heads it up and it's a very powerful yeah. story to start when you're going to do that. And we thought we'd create, well, I'll, the goal is to create a bit more content that you guys could use but maybe something online or, or down the track to get yeah. a bit more awareness for what you do. So maybe do you want to tell us about uh, your involvement in that and the more in depth about the programs and what it's trying to achieve? Yeah, yeah. So um, Satellite, like I said, it's a it's an organisation that's, at the moment it's relatively small. It's not as big as something like Beyond Blue, but we try to create really high quality connections with the young people who we meet, um, which means that, Rose Cuff, the found one of the co-founders, has met some young people when they were like 10 years old and now knows them and they're sort of in their 20s, late 20s and um, one of them's pregnant at the moment with their own child. So really like that long period of time working with someone and um, getting to know young people who otherwise don't have a lot of positive contact with services. Um, mm -hmm. I know I had this conversation a bit with you and sometimes, and it's definitely what I see in the research that I do and the people that I speak, young people that I speak with, is that a lot of the time the focuses of mental health services are on like crisis and they're really on your parent. Um, and despite lots of pushes to be much more family focused, um, generally speaking, they're just looking at the parent as an adult and um, not looking at their family. So Satellite really offers an opportunity for the children in those situations to get a bit of support, meet other kids who have a similar experience, um, get involved in things like music. There's a music art and songwriting workshop. There's photography workshops and we do camps. Um, I've also been really involved in some leadership programs for sort of early, late adolescents and um, young adults. Just getting them connected because again like they mightn't have had those opportunities when they were young i definitely didn't get access to those sorts of things when i was younger something like satellite didn't exist as far as i knew back then um so yeah i, I think it's really important to offer those programs to young adults as well um yeah and that's been an amazing thing to be part of uh, unfortunately, like a lot of small organisations, we rely on funding, I guess, the generosity of um, the, the community and also various, I guess, funding bodies. We have to pitch for funding against other organisations um, mm. and try to show our impact. Measure We have to measure that along the way if we can um, and we're definitely trying to do that as, as much as we can. But yeah, one of the opportunities that we had to pitch for funding was um, a group called the Funding Network. They run, um, it's like crowdfunding. They get a room full of corporate people who are interested in social justice and they listen to a speak for, I think it's like five minutes total. Um, and part of it is really telling the story of, of why you do what you do and um, giving a clear way that you'll use whatever funds that people um, generously donate. Mm. So, yeah, I spoke about my experiences with my dad um, at the start of that and what it was like to grow up not having those kind of, um, not having an organisation that offered me connections to other young people who knew what I was going through. So it felt pretty isolating. Um, and there's lots of things that come with mental illness that um, unfortunately other people, well, maybe fortunately, other people don't necessarily get unless they've been through it. So, um, yeah, just sharing that with people and getting across really what it feels like to be in that experience, 
feeling isolated, the ups and downs of family life and sort of the rifts that can form in families because of the consequences of an illness. Um, yeah, and how they can really change the person that you love deeply and yeah, it creates a lot of internal conflict but also in conflict in the family. So, mm. yeah, that's, that's what great. I shared with them. Yeah. That's great. And, um, yeah, I've had a very – I think my experience is we obviously had parents with bipolar. Mine was a single parent. You had the, you had a, a mother and a father the whole, the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. So what I want to touch on is a couple of things you mentioned is – um. With the, how do you measure the impact? For me, it's it's very it's very interesting to me how to measure the impact. Like, you know, how do yeah. you say, right, we we got involved with this kid at ten years old, and if he didn't have this, his path would have been maybe this, and then, but yeah. because of our impact, you know what I mean? Like over a long period of time, it just seems to me it's an unfair, almost, you know, that's how you've got to try and justify it. Yeah, it's super tough, um, especially because satellite has been really interested in those quality long term connections. And also surviving on mainly volunteers and then more more recently a little bit more funding. Um, mm. But to get that funding and maintain that funding, yeah, measuring your impact, which is like the language, you know, um, is really important. And a lot of other organisations look at how many kids they connect with, how many kids they can move through a program. Um, and that's that's one way you can measure things. How many seat? How many bums do you get on seats, sort of? But um, there's other ways, I guess, measuring at the start and the end of a program. What what are their levels of self-esteem? I prefer self-compassion. Um, like how do they think about themselves and treat themselves in hard times? Also talking to them about the changes that happen in how they see their family and how they relate with their family. So. You can measure that with numbers, um, but also you can just talk to people. And there's a lot of young people who've had really high quality conversations with their parents about what they need and what's been going on for them that they didn't have ever before being involved in a satellite program. So I can measuring from, those yeah. things and yeah. Yeah, I can imagine just a personal experience hearing you say that sort of stuff was sort of like as a kid, like you know, I had no idea how to deal with it. So all this stuff you're exactly saying, I'm sure you're in a similar boat, um, would have been highly beneficial. Yeah. So how does the identification process go? So let's say if it's regional areas or metro areas, how do these kids yep. get identified and then put into this program? What happens there? Yeah. So I guess that's also a really important and also tricky seemingly um, part because there's so many organisations out there and um, people working in mental health sectors need to be across all of that so that they can refer families towards them. So getting in contact with mental health services, letting them know that we exist, that satellite exists and that we're a space um, for all young people, not just young people who are having a really hard time themselves, but young people who just want to connect, just want to chat. They might not have um, difficulties with their mood or anxiety or anything, but it's a real um, preventative sort of strategy to make sure those things don't develop and so that they can um, maximise their well-being and have futures that are full of potential and possibilities. Um, so getting in contact with those mental health services. Then also like teachers. Teachers can are often aware of these things mm, going on in yeah. their students' families. Yeah, so them knowing and, and directing kids to these kind of organisations um, is really important. And we're trying to increase our online presence, which is something that um, is really important, and I know you know that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so jazzing up the website, trying to engage on um, Instagram and those sorts of things so that a kid who's, yeah, struggling can literally just Google what's going on, like, how do I figure this out and they'll find satellite and then just be able to jump on the website and connect with us without even having to go through any adults because often the adults are kind of the gatekeepers to getting support and a lot of young kids in these circumstances they're pretty independent they can do a lot for themselves um, and sometimes it's sometimes getting that support is hard because that means acknowledging that they need a bit of support and they're so focused on looking after other people sometimes um, so yeah, just being able to reach out on their own or through adults that they trust. Now, before 
Now, before, I don't know what your experience was, but before um, this whole sort of thing existed, what was in place that you know of in terms of solving this sort of problem? Was there anything in place or is this sort of a newish sort of thing that's happening or? Yeah, um, there are lots. I've been fortunate to meet a lot of the people who work um, sort of solely in this area and getting to know them personally. I know that they're actually incredibly generous and good people, but unfortunately there's not very many of them. And like I said, a lot of the time mental health services are so focused on crisis that they don't respond um, in ways that help the whole family. So a lot of um, mental health workers don't know actually how to help a whole family and therefore they don't they don't do it because they are afraid of getting it wrong, um, mm. which you can understand, but that's a problem, obviously. So, yeah, for a long time there wasn't a lot offered to kids. There were um, there were small organisations and an organisation called Cop Me has, always, has been around for a long time. That's children of parents with mental illness. And they've merged into a big organisation called Emerging Minds, which is all about all different kinds of, children who have some experience of adversity in their life. Um, so they're really good. They're actually helping Satellite out with a little bit of funding at the moment to run some programs and do some of that um, evaluation and um, testing of the impact, which is mm. great. So, yeah, definitely there wasn't much, not when I was young and I think when, when you were young, um, but inc there is more increasingly so. And luckily the Royal Commission coming out has checked in with families and with kids um, and with advocates for those people and is has really clear um, guidelines on how to how to look at families and how to support families. So more and more the legislation and the policies are pointing in this direction. Unfortunately the lag between that yeah. and actual on the ground opportunities can can be like 10 years is what I've heard. So as much as we can speed that up, we mm. need to. <laughs> I don't know good. if you saw it the other day, but the, um, the, the someone in Queensland, I don't know who it was, a health minister or someone, it was he shared his story yeah. online. I don't know if you saw that. And then you had, um, he grew up with a, I think his mum had schizophrenia or bipolar or something. And he shared the story and everyone's going, you know, how brave and that. But you see the comments. Yeah. I had a similar thing, I had a similar thing, I had a similar thing. You look at their really? profile, it's all from people who are age 50 to 60. So it's quite interesting yeah. for me because there'd be people in parliaments or stuff now of significant, let's say, influence and wealth who would have had a similar situation really? and you never hear anything about it or there's no, there's nothing prioritised towards it, which for me is quite baffling. Um, I don't know if it's totally. a generation or it's something they're just too embarrassed to, to share even if they're a, a bit older and a bit more mature. I just think it's, it's quite strange because yeah. statistically you would know there would be a significant number of people in those positions or whatever who would have had a similar yeah. experience in some sort of way. Definitely. We know that at least or around about a quarter of children under 18 years in Australia mm. have at least one parent or guardian who has a mental illness. And that doesn't include substance use disorders, that statistic. And it also doesn't include families that kind of don't recognise that that's what's going on. It probably doesn't include families where a parent tends to be... Um, fairly anxious or a bit low, but doesn't really meet criteria for a mental illness. So there are things that, it, yeah, it, me too, it baffles me that this isn't more of a thing. Um, every time I go back to that that statistic, it's like it's, it's a quarter of people mm. and that's only under 18. So, yeah, when you take into account young adults and older adults, it's it's a massive number of people. It's not an us and them thing either. It's a, it's a we because it's so so common but yeah I think it has been really heavily stigmatized and layers of that are coming off but mm. and if you want to be idealistic you'd say that there wasn't there wasn't the stigma anymore but when you think about you know when I think about sharing my story I have to consider what I, I do consider what will people think of me when they know this about me? What will they think about my family? Will they judge my family? Will people judge my dad for taking his life? And there are people who do. And that's, mm. I have to put, you know, I have to put that on the line and consider those things. And that's, I guess, some evidence of there still being stigma 
even for someone who's really comfortable talking about it, relatively mm. speaking. Yeah, and no, I experienced a similar thing. You know, my mum's got dementia now at 61 and, you know, she's in a mm. nursing home full time, but she still goes the sh down the street sometimes and you hear things back from people and stuff, which is not very nice and mm. uh, sort of tarnishes you and reflects bad on, badly on you. And even as a young kid, you know, even going to school, yeah. you might get some. I was pretty lucky. I was a bit more, I wasn't I wasn't bullied or anything at school, so I was a bit lucky. But yeah. um, you still get you still get the occasional comment and, and all that sort of stuff. So I can understand the stigma still there. Maybe that's the same, mm. maybe that's the case with people a bit older and, in those positions yeah. where I can push it through, which was which I found interesting was the response to this guy's story because I don't think it wouldn't be uncommon at all uh, for people. That happens all the time, yeah. When I talk about the research that I do um, just at parties or at gatherings, so many people just say to me, oh, yeah, that's my parent, that's my mum, that's my dad, um, who never would have said it until I, you know, until you have the conversation and say, I get this because this this happened to me. People recognise that oh you're okay to talk about it, so I can be okay to talk about it too. Um, mm -hmm. It's amazing how that tiny act of of speaking about it can connect with someone and give someone an opportunity to say something that they've never said before. So probably those people posting it was an opportunity mm -hmm. they'd never had before. Yeah, it's quite interesting. I did a video a while ago. Um, about it and posted on my own Facebook and my Facebook is closed, right? So it's only with internal people. And I got a yeah. lot of messages, direct messages, you know, from that saying, oh, my mum had thing and blah, blah, blah. It was quite interesting uh, to yeah. see the amount that came from it, which is um, really important to get content out there online or for someone to at least uh, start pushing Definitely. stuff a bit more online, whether it be high profile or whoever. Um, now, I want to talk more about the programs in, in itself. So why, mm -hmm. was, so why were these programs created? Um, what are some of the things you really want to achieve with them obviously you mentioned connecting people who have similar experiences yep. but ha what's involved in those programs itself yeah so we actually just over this last week had a couple of meetings to really clarify where we want to go from here um, and what what are, are we trying to achieve one of our biggest um, modalities I guess or the biggest things we use is creativity so like I said, we have music art and songwriting workshops. Um, we do story sharing, just talking about what happened, but in different ways. So creativity can allow people to do that. Like we said, listening to music is a, is a good way. Um, for some young people, listening to music is the only time they can really connect what they're feeling to someone else's feelings. Um, and then painting or creating something is a way to express yourself like creating a podcast is a way to express what's important mm. to you um yeah so those workshops kids go along and for a couple of days they all get together there's like 20 kids um and they learn how to make music using garage band and they um sort of dj their own songs and they write lyrics and we've got a um music teacher and a songwriter who runs the workshop and she sort of helps them each workshop ideas. Um, they do sort of drawing and like creative activities like that as well. Um, and at the end they come together and they make one big song together. So they kind of have their own little songs that they get to make and one big song. Um, another one that's really simple is a photography workshop. That's for a little bit older um, adolescents. Um, and they get together and they go out and take photos and then they come back and learn how to edit those photos um, using software. Um, we got some iPads through a grant so we can they can go and use those iPads that we supply and um, hoping to, I, I can't remember what it's called and I should, but I just found out that there's a big photography competition that um, is about expressing mental health experiences through photography and they want to okay. connect with yep. satellite mm -hmm. um, and their youth um, prize is going to be called like the satellite foundation award which will be really cool um, yeah so expressing sort of what you see in life through photography um, we run camps which is just like bringing heaps of kids together um, doing all sorts of activities we had one in Anglesey late last year. Um, I'm from Geelong, so it meant a lot to be able to run something down here for the kids down in this mm -hmm. area because uh, the satellite's been mostly up in Melbourne and it was started sort of along the peninsula. Um, yeah, so that was really cool to bring that to Geelong. They got to, again, there was lots of art and um, 
activities like that. But then we also did some, we planted some uh, plants, I guess, grew some flowers to sort of talk about self-care, um, the sorts of things you need to do to look after a plant and the sorts of things you need to do to look after yourself. Um, we did some education type stuff, how to reach out for help, what kind of uh, helpers you have in your life, sort of on your like five fingers, who would you talk to if you're going through a tough time, including like calling kids helpline and how do you do that, those sorts of things. And then, um, yeah, so that was really awesome, really fun. And the kids get to know each other so well and then they, uh, they you know, want to go back on the next camp and want to stay in touch. So we try to stay in touch with them um, throughout the year and have small catch-ups as well. And then the more... The one for the older groups is a young leader program, so a series of workshops and get-togethers where young adults can sh get to know each other, share their experiences and learn sort of, yeah, how to be a leader, what does that mean, how do you get a message out there, um, how do you tell your story in a way that's safe for you, um, what else, sort of how to do group facilitation. So it's kind of like training them up if they're interested in sort of working in any spaces like that or doing any advocacy. And then we mm -hmm. connect them with opportunities to do that, to public speak about what they've been through, to sort of spread the message. Um, yeah, and do some volunteering, that sort of thing. That's really good. There's great lots to of hear. different programs, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine anyone interested to go to the website or Facebook, Instagram and check it out. Yeah. Now, I want to ask you more about, that's quite interesting to me because I had not, like I said, I'm just trying to relate this all back to myself and to my experience, which is probably yeah. says anyone watching or listening is probably thinking the same thing if they're in a, yeah, in a definitely. similar position. So what's, like for me as a kid, I had no awareness of that this was like a, an issue. You're so with inside yourself. You get no, the yeah. only time you're having any interaction is either with the, um, you know, the nurses at the psych ward or let's say, you might be taken in to sit down in a meeting with the psychologist, but they're talking to someone else, not yourself. So yeah. just I think just having that, being put in that situation as a young person, right, everyone here is in a very similar situation, just does wonders for itself alone, just by mm -hmm. saying, oh, okay, yeah. this is not just me. You know, it's not, oh, why was me? Oh, it's, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's everyone else yeah. is going through this and, you know, what can we do uh, to get better and all that sort of stuff and improve? Yeah. And also seeing, um, we try to have, people with lived experience mm. run or involved at least in running camps and any of the workshops. So like myself, but also other facilitators, we get involved because it's kind of a way to see that, you know, maybe some people think that, um, oh, the cat, someone's letting the cat in my room. <laughs> sorry. Um, um, sorry, where was I? Oh, yeah, it's uh, just a way uh, to see. Yeah. yeah, it's just a way to see that, you know, there might be a lot of people who think that I don't have much going for me. You know, some kids have a lot going on. It's not just that a parent has a mental illness, but they struggle a lot with um, poverty. They might not get a lot of opportunities from that perspective. And a lot of people might look at them and not think that they're going to make very much of themselves. And they, they might think that of themselves. Um, and that's one of the saddest things, I think. So the ability to see, it's sort of like a mentoring kind of thing, the ability to see someone who's actually doing awesome stuff, they have this experience but they've overcome it and they're making something of their lives that, that matters to them um, is, is amazing. It's beautiful to speak to a young person. Like there were some moments on the camp where I got to speak to some adolescents about what they were going through and let them know that, I understood what they meant and I was there as a volunteer because I cared deeply about making their experience different and the way that they received that, just the the recognition in their eyes and sort of recognising that, hey, maybe I can do some more and these are people who care about me and, and want me to see, um, you know, mm. want me to do great things in life is, yeah, it's pretty awesome. I think what you said about the lived experience is absolutely key. Um, cause I know growing up, if you know, that's, well, that's the big thing for me. If it was all a psychologist, we were trying to talk to you. It's like, well, did you have someone with this situation? As soon as I said, no, yeah. I would just shut down and wouldn't listen to them because it's not something that I think the lived experience thing is really, really important, which is why I hope if anyone listens or watches this, who's not, who has a similar experience is to try and get involved. So I want to talk about now. So someone, yeah. let's say someone like me or whoever else wants to actually do something about it or start giving up their time. Is it just 
purely a donation thing or how can people get involved who are in similar situations? Yeah, um, so I think if you're around uh, Victoria, you can definitely reach out to Satellite Foundation through their website, through our website um, and through the Instagram. Just shoot us a message saying that you'd love to help. Um, when we run camps, we look for volunteers for camps. Um, we've had some volunteers who, yeah, like you say, uh, through their life they've had their own kids, but this was their experience and they never got a chance to go on a camp with other kids who get it, so they come along and help out. But then we've also had volunteers who don't have that experience and seeing them learn and seeing them recognise how strong and awesome the kids on our camps are is, is really cool as well. So get involved in that way. Um, I think having a conversation with people you trust uh, too, so if it doesn't involve satellite or you're not near us, um, yeah, just have a conversation with people you trust. Let them know if, if you trust them that you, this is your experience and like you say, you might be very surprised who says, yeah, me too. Mm. Obviously, we always need funding. So if you're in a position to do some fundraising in any way at your, at your office or with, with family or friends, um, shooting some funding our way, we make sure that every dollar goes to making sure our camps are great, um, gets another kid involved with a workshop. Um, so every dollar kind of really counts when you're in a small organisation and goes a long way. We make it go a long way. So, yeah, fundraising, reaching out to volunteer or literally just spreading the word that this is a thing and um, we can do some more about it. And I want to touch on now your, um, you're doing, a, was it a master's or you're doing a doctorate in? Yeah, I'm doing a doctorate. Yeah. And was that obviously inspired by your childhood to go on that sort of path or? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I've always been really interested in like what makes people tick. Why do people love what they love? I always think I had this maths teacher who was like obsessed with trigonometry and I didn't like it at all and he just loved it. So I was like really fascinated by that. But I mean, yeah, one of the things that definitely drives me towards it is wanting to figure out, well, how do I make people's lives easier than mine was, easier than my dad's was? Um, mm. So, yeah, championing these sorts of issues, I try to do that. I try to speak up about them when I'm on placement. I try to speak up about them when I'm in classes um, and hope that I'm actually teaching my fellow students a little bit along the way as well. So what are the responses you're finding from people when you share it? Um, you know, people people get it. You know, like we said, people say, yeah, me too. Um, some people don't necessarily, they go like, oh yeah, I maybe didn't recognise that that was as big of an issue as it is. Um, I think I asked them what they thought would be the biggest barriers that like what gets in the way of people like you or people who want to want to help. They're all there because they want to help. Um, but stops them from actually reaching out to kids and families and you know, they, they all felt like probably it's not knowing what to do or what to say or where to go to to um, actually provide that support. Where else to, if they can't do it, where else do I direct it to? So, yeah, not really knowing how to handle it is probably what came up the most other than, yeah, I get it, me too. Mm. Now, what I want to currently talk about, um, you mentioned the uh, the Royal Commission stuff and, and so what's been happening? So I don't know about your experience, but back in the day, it was basically, you know, parent committed to the psychiatric ward. If you didn't have a guardian, you'd be foster home or wherever else, and that was it. Like there was no yeah. no one to check in on you or anything like that, which I found a bit frustrating. Or you'd go into the, the psychiatric ward, let's say, with the, the foster person or the guardian, and you'd have to sit yeah. in the doctor. I wouldn't talk to you. They would just talk to the person, and, you know, you would be ignored, and that was mm -hmm. it. Even from a social work perspective, there wasn't much social work intervention so I'm just sort of trying to see because you have a bit more a lot more knowledge about it than me in regards to how everything works at the moment what's the current situation right now let's say if it was a similar situation for you or for me what's currently happening yep. at the moment yeah so I was involved in like I said emerging minds they make a lot of resources for places like um, places like schools places like uh, psych wards or hospitals um, resources for both 
like people who work there and also for, for parents and families in how to manage these situations. So uh, in the last year I was involved in sort of proofreading one of those documents or some of those documents about how do you get kids in to visit their parents, how do you kind of navigate those situations. So they're really committed to getting the lived experience perspective, which is awesome. And I try when when those opportunities come up to share them with as many people who I know have this experience and get perspective so that I can kind of get across, um, you know, a really rich, uh, helpful opinion. Um, so what they, they've got now some places have family rooms so they'll get you into, yeah, nicer space so you don't have to walk through all the, the whole hospital which can be quite confronting for a young person. Um, but also they, they actually put an effort into connecting parents with their kids while they're in there. So getting them to write letters, getting them to make phone calls and also and facilitating that, helping it happen and not just, yeah, basically ignoring it, which is potentially what used, what, what used to happen and unfortunately might still happen in some places. Um, mm. In sort of one-on-one -on -one work, you can just ask uh, you can just ask someone if they're a parent and you can ask someone if their parent has a mental illness. Um, and then with that information, you can say, you know, is there someone you want involved in our support together? Is there someone that's really important for that? And if you sort of think in the back of your mind, well, sounds like, you know, maybe the kids need some support or it sounds like maybe it would be great if we could all get together, then you suggest those sorts of things um, Obviously, you need consent for all these sorts of things as well um, to involve other people, but it's more and more recognised that it's really important to engage families in what happens when people leave hospital, for example, because what's happened in the past and what happened to my family was that um, I was quite young, but my mum wasn't really spoken to about what would happen when dad came out of hospital a few times. Um, so she wasn't prepared and as a family, you know, we didn't feel prepared to have that happen. Um, and you can imagine if someone's a single parent and that happens to their kids, there's probably not a, not a lot of conversation that happens like how do you feel about them coming out, what do you need in place to make life easier for you. Um, mm. So those sorts of things should be happening now and there's good policies, there's some um, really clear guidelines both from um, both in research but also, yeah, uh, policies. I can link those to you. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but I can link them to you so you can, like, show people. Sure. Um, but yeah, we know now and it's we know what to do, but it's just getting people practising doing it. Yeah, no, it's, it's very interesting because, um, yeah, we had a single mum, so just come out of hospital and that was it. She'd come home and sweet mum's home and that's that's it. That's all you know and a while you go back to normal again yeah. for another reason. So... It was very interesting. Definitely. So what's, what research are you finding interesting at the moment? You obviously read a lot of research papers and stuff like that. Um, what, is there anything happening yeah. at the moment that you find quite interesting? Or Well, I'm finding my research really interesting at the moment. That's most of, <laughs> mostly let's, what let's I'm let's doing. Let's go into that then. Let's talk about your research. Yeah. Yep. I'm looking at um, self-compassion amongst children who have parents with mental illness. So I've looked at all the published articles that are sort of um, describing what children go through and having a look at, well, does self-compassion come up in that? And so self-compassion is basically having a balanced awareness of what you're going through in hard times and recognising your need for sort of comfort and then offering yourself kindness and comfort in response. So. A lot of people either shut down their negative emotions, they kind of bottle things up. Um, they might think that they don't deserve care or support. They might be a bit harsh on themselves when they're going through a hard time. Particularly for kids who have parents with mental illness, they might do a lot of caring and then they feel guilty for needing care themselves. So that's I've been looking into it that a bit and then I got to do some interviews with some young adults about what do they think about self-compassion. Um, do they think it's any good? Do they think it's a bit of rubbish? Um, how could it be helpful or, you know, unhelpful? So, yeah, I'm in the process of kind of analysing what's come out of that, but definitely our society doesn't help us be very self-compassionate. You know, it's, 
it's sort of celebrated to be really busy and celebrated to be a bit tough on yourself. Um, definitely in a sporting context that I've come from, that's um, my experience. So yeah, maybe we can do a bit more to share how we look after ourselves more publicly um, and also maybe in, incorporate some of these concepts of actually checking in with how you're feeling and offering yourself care, even though and even when you need to look after the people around you. Mm. So I'm really interested in that in the moment, yeah. Mm. I was going to say, what are some of the things you meet so many young people or young adults in the same here's a similar situation what are some common themes or some common things that you're finding out that those people share in common yeah um definitely the feeling of uh you know not knowing anything like this existed so not knowing that something like satellite existed um not not really knowing or recognizing how many other people go through these experiences um feeling then isolated by that, like not being able to talk openly to friends or get support the support that they need. Mm. Um, sometimes there's expectations put on young people to sort of, especially when they get a bit older, to be the carer. And then um, I know some people who live interstate from their parents and when they're involved in the parents' care, um, they get a bit of backlash from the workers for not being, you know, not living where their parent lives. Um, so there's a bit of pressure actually to assume those caring roles and kind of not get on with your own life or, you know, kind of do both at once. So that's yeah. something too that it's really hard to be your own person sometimes when um, someone in your family takes up so much space and they need support yeah, and we love you're them. Right. But, Sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but I completely agree. And the, what I say is, I, my, I'm very lucky. My mum's had eleven, one of eleven, so she, she lives in a small country town in Warrnambool. So they're all there. So I'm very lucky because it would have been having yeah. these stuff. But I, I was very cynical even to recently. I say I've paid my dues. You know, so I'm in Melbourne. I'm doing my thing. I paid my dues. I paid my dues. I yeah. paid my dues. Someone else's problem. So I can completely relate. That's what you said. Yeah. So um, yeah. sorry for the interruption. Keep, keep no, going. No, no, that's great because it's it is true. It's like, and you shouldn't even really have to say I paid my dues, but we kind of, you know, you you love your family as much as they might want to might make you want to tear your hair out. Sometimes mm. we love our families and um, we we do anything for them, but that can mean that you don't do anything for yourself. And sometimes it's necessary to like branch out and, and do things for you so that you literally can get back when you're um, when you've got your feet under you to keep helping from time to time. Um, and I think that's totally fine and totally fair enough. And kids should be able to be kids and they should be able to grow up and be young adults and um, make make bad decisions if they want to a bit um, and not have to, you know, wear, wear the weight of the world on their shoulders all the time. Yeah, I want, uh, that one line you said, which is really, really pertinent, is the kids should be kids thing. And I think what a lot of people don't realise is when you're exposed to such a, like, a, like you, the, the hard thing I found, I don't know about you, but you, I went to a lot of mates' house or whatever. You see a, you see a normal family, right? You see you know, both parents work or this, you know, whatever. It's a really normal sort of environment. And you go from that environment yeah. to your environment and you're sort of going, well, why is, why, do I, why is mine like this and everywhere else I go is like this? You know? And it's one of those things is trying to, um, almost yeah kids be kids because you do from a young age you soon become really aware that your parents are not the same as these other yeah. people and you start to get resentful like well why can't she or why can't he just be normal like everyone else you know you sort of sometimes yeah. form that mindset especially growing up and it can lead to a lot of things i don't know about you but i've i definitely when i was younger played the victim a lot you know you know well uh, against me all this yeah. sort of stuff and it wasn't until very as i got a bit more mature and so i sort of fell out of that and sort of said well yeah. I, turned, I, I personally looked at it as a positive so I think growing up meant like a parent in that situation, you're definitely a lot more resilient and you're very, I think a lot more kids are resilient or inadaptable um, yeah. and, and there's so much change they have to get used to. So I think that's the way I sort of look at it now. It's sort of a strength as opposed to a weakness. Yeah, so, so those are definitely things that come up a lot as well um, and definitely in the recent research I've been doing, that idea of like your family's not normal, you're different, mm. but it's not just that you're different, it's that there's something wrong with your family and who you are because of that. So that comes on a lot. Um, 
it's also fairly typical of adolescents to feel like they're like, woe is me, you know, why is all this bad stuff happened to me and feel pretty alone in what they're going through. So that's fairly like typical. But then there's another layer of that when there's actually, you know, a lot of stuff going on and you're actually having to make pretty massive decisions about the health and, you know, the life of your parent or a loved one. So there's some kids who are really involved in caring for their siblings as well, um, so that can come up as well for them. Mm. But, yeah, and, again, you're totally right that that resilience that you get from overcoming really hard stuff um, puts you in good stead for the rest of your life. You, you have a perspective about the world that you wouldn't otherwise have. Um, you know, you work really hard for what you want and you appreciate the good people that you have in your life. Um, that's why my family is so important to me because, you know, I've been through so much with them um, and obviously having lost my, my dad, um, it means a lot to keep those people close to me. Um, but, yeah, I think that going through really hard things made me really focused at times because if I'd get into the zone with something, it meant that I wasn't thinking about, like, the swirling you know, dangers around me um, or the what ifs of what, what could come next. Um, so that happened with sport, that happened with schoolwork for me. Um, and like I said, I loved singing and I loved drama and so it meant I got really stuck into things. Um, and now I'm really stuck into doing this research and this work and I'm so passionate about it because I hope that other young people who have grown up in similar circumstances to me and I've been pretty lucky. I've had my mum and, you know, I've had a roof over my head. I've been able to go to a good school and, and do things like sport, art, drama, um, that a lot of kids don't get all those opportunities. So I would love to be part of making that their lives better and more full of potential and, yeah, helping them um, achieve their dreams and their goals. Mm. No, I think it's very important. That's a great that's a great thing to say. And I just want to talk really quickly now. Obviously, uh, you do research and you talk to a lot of people. I don't know if we touched on this a bit earlier. We probably did. I want to find out again, though. When you, when you talk directly to a psychologist or psychiatrist, or what do they say about the kids in the situation or the family unit specifically? Um, as in what are their opinions on yeah, what they like need? What are they yeah, what do they need or how is it sort of how can they help or do they have any interest at all? Because I remember talking to a few few people down in um down in Warnable who uh, run the programs down there and they basically said to me, Look, they've got no real interest in that. I know that's probably not the case, but that was that was what I was told. So I'm just trying to sort yeah. of get into what's the current what's the current like if there's a the treating psychiatrist of the parent, what's their current involvement or what are they thinking about when there's kids involved in the situation? How do they handle that if they're even considered at all? Yeah, so unfortunately it varies a lot. There are probably people who work in a very one-on-one -on -one way and they think, you know, I only, you know, I only do what I can. And I think in a lot of um, public sectors it is, like, you have to do a lot with um, potentially very little. So, you know, I recognise those, those challenges. But... Um, yeah, so some people aren't doing a lot in terms of reaching out to to families or doing much about the kids. Or they might just ask the parent, how's your kid going? And they might say, they're fine. And then it's like, oh, job's done, um, um, which is one thing to do. It's good to ask. But we also know that a lot of kids don't tell their parents if they're struggling. That's sort of what I've gleaned from my reading. Um and talking to people, you sort of, you know, you're the strong one in the family. You don't, you don't make waves because it makes your own life easier and life easier for your family. But that means that just asking someone else how you're doing, someone else asking about you, um, your parent doesn't necessarily know that you need help. So some uh, workers will speak directly to kids, speak directly to other people in the household. Um, maybe just once to touch base and, you know, it may very well be that a kid doesn't want to be involved but um, other options are linking them with other services. So 
Fortunately, now we have in Victoria, we've got um, a FAPME program, which is families affected by parental mental illness. There's a lot of acronyms, unfortunately, <laughs> in the well sort of sector. Yeah. Um, but that's head up by actually Rose Cuff, who is the um, founder of Satellite. So she's also the statewide FAPME coordinator. And what they do, they go out into, um, they've got someone in a lot of different areas of Victoria. Um, or different people in different areas who are basically like they hold a lot of knowledge about what it's like, they hold a lot, of, a, a lot of knowledge about what programs exist and so if a mental health worker wasn't sure what to do, they could go to that person and ask them for advice or guidance um, and that person should be delivering sort of education in the organisation that they work in. Um, yeah, I also know of one good thing that's being done that I've been a little bit, tiny bit involved in is they're trying to get uh, a mental health worker in every school in Victoria and Origin is helping out writing that program um, and they're going to specifically make some materials that are about well, how do you identify when a child in the school or a student has this experience at home and if that's the case, what, what can we do? So I was a bit involved in helping them do that um, but that's a big project that's happening and I think that would be awesome. If there was just someone in every school who could support teachers with what to do because like we said earlier teachers have a lot of knowledge of what's going on but they might not know exactly what to do about it so I think that person will be really important from that perspective too. That's a quite interesting development actually and that would go a long way I guess to destigmatizing yeah. even for the parents themselves knowing that that's involved in the school and for the teachers, that's quite big. Is that when's the, is there an estimate on that, or is it just sort of something that they're working on now? Well, I don't know. I don't know when, but I think hopefully in the next year they're going to try and roll that out. And so this was just one part of that program mm -hmm. to sort of have some materials um, about and some training in how to help kids who are in this circumstance. Um, yeah, and just sort of what sort of stuff could be helpful from a school perspective because. I don't know, the mental health sector doesn't need to hold everything. It would be great if more people in the community, mm. not just people working in the mental health settings, um, knew about this stuff and could, could do some help because, um, like we said, it's so common that kids might not need to go and see a psychologist or a social worker. They might just need to have a trusted teacher at school who checks in on them every now and again. Um, I definitely know I had teachers who sort of knew what was going on for me. Um, there were teachers who I wouldn't dream of talking to, but some that were really, really nice and helpful and good to know they were in your corner. So I think that that will be a really good thing. Yeah, and I completely agree. I had a similar experience with my school as well because it was a small town in Warrnambool and I had yeah. a similar people looking out for you. And you're right, you, you might not have liked them or whatever, but they did have your best interest and they got me out of a lot of trouble, especially at school. Um, yeah. Probably, but uh, yeah, I completely agree with that, and um, that sounds quite exciting. So your involvement was that was the um, you were advising or were you consulting on that side of what you know yeah, about just, for the yeah, just doing a little bit of consulting. Um, so giving them an example sort of case, um, you know, an example of a young person who might not um, obviously look like they need a bit of help, but maybe they do need a bit of a check in. And once they've got some things together, they'll send them through and I'll um, have a little look through and make sure that they're sort of speaking from the speaking with the heart of the uh, lived experience in mind. And I try to, you know, like I said, I carry the experiences of other people that I've spoken with, but mm. these are really great initiatives that are going on already. Um, different organisations, particularly FAPME, trying to reach out and talk to people who get it and get their expertise on board these sorts of projects because it's really important we can't just have um, we can't just have all these interventions or whatever made up without any of the actual experience at the heart of them so it's pretty good I think it, I think it's quite interesting because um it's very hard to say like as you said how to measure the impact but you know just hearing this sort of stuff and having it if I was in I'm just thinking about my own experience because that's what I can relate to yeah. but, Having that sort of stuff at a young age would have definitely helped me out a heap and I can imagine a lot of other people and yeah. they might have made certain life choices based on you know what was going on and which has affected right through it to adulthood 
Um, they might mm. not have the, as good as drug prospects. There might be abuse, substance abuse problems. There could be various things which could have maybe been, yeah. let's say, avoided if there was some sort of networking or some sort of like something like what you are involved in at that stage in life, which obviously helps the economy and all that sort of stuff. So it baffles me. Yeah. Still, as we were saying about the numbers that people who are in the position who write the checks and allocate the money, there's not more money out at all allocated to this sort of stuff, which I just find are quite fascinating. Yeah. Hmm. Fortunately, also this recent, um, I did hear carers mentioned in this recent COVID-19 hmm. extra funding thing. Um, so I don't know exactly what that looks like, but hopefully it will mean that there's a bit more funding put into support for yeah, kids who take on various levels of caring at home. And sometimes they the don't founders. identify as carers, but yeah. Yeah, that's, that's I think it's interesting funny... what you said. Yeah, what you said now, sorry, I was going to stop and exact, interrupt you with exactly the same point. What is a yeah. carer? Why don't they identify themselves as a carer when they, they probably are an emo emotional or a support person in a way, but they don't recognise it at all because they might be 12 years old or could be 14 yeah. years old or whatever it is. And also, whilst they might recognise that their family might not look like their mate's family, some kids don't feel like their family's different. Sometimes kids have always lived that way and it's like they're normal. So um, helping a parent with medication or getting them up to go to work or feeding their siblings or um, sort of doing a bit more, a few more chores than maybe other kids would be doing um, and they don't recognise themselves as young carers. I definitely didn't recognise myself as a young carer, but I've always been um, a person in my family who's checked on my family members um, emotionally, like how are you going and listened to them and um, offered care from that perspective. It's, it's difficult because, you know, if you put a label to something, it's much easier to give it funding. Um, it's like with the mental health care plan, you have to have a mental health diagnosis attached to you, labelled to you, to get that funding support. Um, and there is a school of thinking that reckons that diagnoses aren't that great in some circumstances. So the idea of having to label kids at a really young age, um, you know, I wonder about it sometimes. So Satellite doesn't use young carer title, but there are other organisations that do, and it does help them get good funding because, like I said, now there's a bit more um, of a government incentive and a government initiative to fund those sorts of things. So basically it's any young person who offers care, whether it be practical, kind of obvious, overt care like medication or, yeah, getting their parent up, calling the ambulance if they need to go to hospital, those sorts of things, um, all the way to, yeah, checking on their mental health because um, a lot of... It's surprising to me because <laughs> it wasn't my experience that a lot of young kids don't need to check in on how their parents' mental health is. Um, and then they don't get in that habit. That's not something they do. But for someone who that was like normal to me, it's kind of hard to think of not doing that. But, yeah, so that's sort of what it means. It's quite vague. Mm. Um, but the labelling helps the funding. So what's well. the support? So what happens with the funding? So if it's a young carer or a carer in that situation, what then happens with that? So, I mean, there's uh, Centrelink payments now uh, for carers, including young carers. So. Um, it's like a um, like a youth allowance or like a yeah dole sort of thing, um, income support payments that help them basically survive uh, and also yeah help them survive while they're um, dedicating a lot of their time to their caring responsibilities. Um, obviously, you have to jump through a lot of hoops to get that, and you have to be uh, engaged in doing that caring work at a certain level potentially. It's not something that I've applied for or looked at myself, but I'd imagine you have to. Um, but then, yeah, there are some organisations like Little Dreamers um, helps kids who provide any sort of care to siblings or parents or family members for anything. So they also um, support children who's family members have physical disabilities, cognitive disabilities, um, somatic illnesses like cancer or MS 
or all sorts of things. So they definitely cover a wider array of experiences, um, whereas satellites really specifically for this group of children who have a parent with a mental illness. I think that it's important to hold that space because I think it's a unique experience and it's different than other experiences because we know that when a, I know personally that when a parent has cancer, they there's a lot of support for children. Um, there are some really fantastic organisations involved in delivering that care, um, and you, it's talked about differently. Uh, it's a it's awful. Nothing's better or worse than anything else, but mm. it's um, it's got a different layer of social um, I don't know judgment on it than a child who has a parent with a mental illness who probably can't tell people that's what's going on at home uh, because it carries with it a lot of judgment. So I think it's really important to hold that space in a unique way because it, it does come with different kinds of challenges for kids. Mm, so you're saying not just transplant that content, that's already all that stuff that's already happening in that space to the over across and is a completely unique, thought out, separate, isolated almost plan or programs in place? Yeah, well, some of the stuff is really comparable. Um, some of the actual uh, activities you do with kids, helping them with how they, if they're really stressed out, how do you help them slow their breathing down, what kinds of activities can they do that make them feel better, like getting out and doing exercise or whatever. So some of that stuff is really similar. But then obviously the education might be different. Um, it's really important to give children who have a parent with mental illness information about what's going on um, and that information is obviously different but then I guess um, having groups that have that experience together so satellite just being an organization that has those kind of groups I think is really good because there's a real shared experience so if the experiences were uh, super varied across the spectrum of any kind of health related challenges in the family um, those experiences might be different and I think there's those uh, connections might be different and I think there's so much space for that and it's great that that's happening in different organisations that there's a real broad perspective but I think it's also good to have um, have a space that's just for this this group and they can just get to know each other and everybody gets what it's like to have a parent where there's a bit of stigma around what's going on at home. Um, I, yeah, I think, think that that's great. I think all is good, but yeah, mm. I think it's good to do both. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly right. What you did in the, just getting those people together in the same area and obviously having the same unique experience just by itself is very powerful. And how can you yeah. get yourself into more of the networking, into more of those minds of those healthcare providers in regional areas or other cities or states? All that sort of yeah. stuff as well, which I think is um, a really worthwhile mission. So we'll leave it there for today, I reckon, Addy. So thanks for all the information you provided um, to me as well and gone and going into depth. Really much appreciated. And hopefully people are a lot more yeah. aware. If they want to find out more at Satellite Foundation in uh, Vic, they can just punch into Google. And you guys have Facebook, Instagram as well? Yep. All there. Cool. All there. And um, is there any... And then let's say if there's someone in other states or territories, what's the best thing for them to do? Is it just to punch into Google? Um, what's, what's, what, do they want, what do they need to look up to get connected in their state or their area? Um, I would look up Emerging Minds uh, would probably help connect them with what's going on right in their local area. Um, so contact through Emerging Minds. I know that Kookaburra Kids um, is an organisation that was sort of primarily set up to help children of parents who are in the defence forces um, but they also support children uh, who have parents with mental illness. So sorry, parents who experience mental illness as a sort of associated with their experiences mm. in the defence force. Mm. So they help but across the board as well. So they're in New South Wales and they've also branched out into other states. Um, also, yeah, uh, what did I say, Little Dreamers. Um, might be appropriate and they're in a few different states, predominantly in Victoria, I think, but they've also branched out thanks to some funding. So um, you might have seen Kookaburra Kids when the Invictus Games was on. They got a they got a bunch of funding around that and they were on the news a little bit, which was good. Um, yeah, so there are a few other organisations that I know of, but if you're not in one of those spaces, get online, look up Emerging Minds or um, 
hopefully you can chat to your GP if you if you can chat to a GP about what they recommend like really in your local area if, if that's mm. what you need. Was there much stuff yeah. online that you found uh, now recently that let's say would be helpful or is there anything online or any sort of podcast or anything like that that you can think of that you've come across? Yeah, not podcasts. I mean, there are, there are sort of, there are some good movies, not that they necessarily come to mind, but there are, um, there are some good movies out there that are sort of about the experiences like, what's that movie? About a boy. That's sort of relevant. So those sorts of things are nice to watch and connect with. Um, I don't do much Googling in this space. But there are some good resources, like I said, on Emerging Minds. We're trying to get some up on Satellite Foundation's website and that sort of thing. Um, mm. But, yeah, go to those sorts of locations to get really detailed information. Um, yeah, there's another name of one of the Satellite Foundation ambassadors has a podcast about his experience, um, but I've forgotten what it's called. So, again, I can link it to you. <laughs> Fair enough. Send it through. Yeah, because because when I was researching a lot of this stuff, I that's half the reason why I wanted to do some well, do some content around, which is because I went into yeah. YouTube and just typed in. I thought there'd be some nice polished videos with some substantial amount of views, and there's really not a lot. It's just basically um, there's some either some psychologists talking about in front of a camera, or there's something yeah. someone just talking to a camera really, and it's not something that I've seen where there's any one sort of source of authority on YouTube or any of that video content online where that's yeah. this where this is a topic, which I found quite interesting, just due to the number of people who would have experienced it yeah it's not yeah it's sort of again it comes back to that idea of how actually prevalent it is in our community um, that it's surprising that it doesn't come up in campaigns about mental illness or just generally in information about yeah mental illness it's not like a family goes through it it's like the one person um, it seems to be it's a lot of people talking about mates who have had struggles, which is great too, particularly with guys talking about like connecting with their mates um, and talking about things. Um, again, which is really important to have. I think there's a little bit on Pucker Up. Is that how you say it? I think they've got okay. a little bit of information about, yeah, like dads. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's a great deal in this in this space. And a lot of the really public campaigns don't specifically reach out to this topic. So yeah, I think it's I great thought, you're doing and, yeah. Well, I find it interesting because I had a guy, one of my guests was Simon Hogan who played for Geelong and he was a headspace ambassador for um, yeah. when he was playing for the Cats. He retired due to depression yeah. and he's just been recently diagnosed with bipolar, I think bipolar 2. And we were mm -hmm. saying the same thing. Like he was involved with headspace and it's beyond blue and all this sort of stuff and doing these um, campaigns for the VAFA and, and things. And he's, I sort of said to him, I said, it's quite amazing to me. Like it's all... It's quite interesting how there's all these organisations now for men, for example, and for, for women, yeah. which is all about that. But there's nothing that's gone ever beyond that, which I just find, well, with your stuff's gone beyond that now, but I mean like a really yeah. well-known organisation that has gone beyond that into the family unit or into the kids and stuff, yeah. which is something of the same note as, let's say, a Beyond Blue or over a Headspace or something like that. Yeah. There are some specific websites that... Um, might touch on it maybe like the black dog institute and i know the butterfly foundation which is when uh, family members have eating disorders um, that talk quite a bit about families because there are probably some conditions or some experiences disorders that uh, it's more understood that it impacts the whole family unit um, but i you know I, I would definitely agree that i think across the board there's some sort of involvement of families and if we think in that in that way looking at a whole like system perspective mm. families and schools and society um you know that definitely brings children into the picture and it's not done very much so yeah I, I think do, head space, some headspaces have some programs for kids but again headspaces are all really different they're all funded differently separately and have their own separate programs so you'd have to know your area um, and hopefully if you did reach out to them they'd put you in contact with one of those great fat me workers because I've met lots of them and they're amazing intelligent helpful people um, but yeah there's only one of them in different areas of Victoria so now, do, you, do many of the B, is it, is it sort of something that you guys would like, let's say, part of the bigger organisation? Let's say 
because sometimes they're almost brands in themselves, right? So Beyond Blue is, I would call it a brand, and it's a brand associated with one thing or, let's say, anxiety and depression. But do you think they should yeah. have the ability to then expand, let's say, their portfolio almost in a way with the amount of content or stuff they have online or the messaging? Or how, what, what do you think about that sort of stuff? Yeah, I guess that's like a, yeah, sort of connection merger type thing. Um, and it's always interesting to think about that and whether you'd retain your the core of what you do when you connect in those ways with big organisations that have lots of overheads um, and have lots of their own interests um, and maybe specific interests like you say anxiety, depression, um, doesn't cover the experiences of kids whose parents have schizophrenia um, mm. or eating disorders or um, substance use, just lots of different things basically. So. But it is definitely an avenue to getting more funding and getting out there because a lot of the time those massive organisations get all the funding because they're known of. Um, but unfortunately on those massive levels you've also got big overheads and probably less like um, how do we spend every dollar really carefully, whereas in little organisations um, you spend every dollar really mindfully um, and work really closely and directly with, with your consumers, the people who you meet. So there's sort of those pros and cons with big and small organisations and I guess that's why I'd advocate anyone to check out your local small organisations such as Satellite but on a lot of different fronts. Um, know how they spend their money and if, when, when and if you can invest your time, finances, whatever, um, into those small ones because I've seen that it makes, um, it goes further potentially. It mm. goes a long way. I know we, yeah, we try really hard to make it go a long way. Mm. So if anyone's listening, obviously Google Satellite and obviously all the money goes straight to funding the programs straight and that sort of stuff. Program. There's no... Yeah. Yeah, as you said, every dollar is really well accounted for uh, with the No CEOs on big. <laughs> <laughs> no, We're definitely. just trying to get our, yeah, get our CEO to get something so she can keep doing the work she's doing. Yeah. But it's lots of volunteer work so far. So, yeah. Mm. No, thank was, you. Very, well, thank you very much for your time, Addy, today. I think we've gone for an hour and a half and I really do appreciate it. And for anyone who's interested to Google the various organisations you mentioned, and we'll put a few links to the uh, into the description there. And Hopefully, if anyone's watching wants to get involved, they can look you up. But is there anything you want to leave us with today, Addy, or anything, um, I don't know, that you want a final note before we sign we'll off? Final words. No, thank you yeah. so much, John. I think it's so great what you're doing and giving a different, um, you know, giving a less, like, clinical perspective on this thing is really important and um, hearing different voices on, on this topic. Um, so thank you. And, yeah, to anyone watching, Thanks for watching all the way through. <laughs> and um, yeah, if you can put some money, put some money in it. If you can't, just spread the word. Um, yeah. So thanks, Addy. We'll leave it there. Thank you very much.